I'm going to get done if you got kids up there, right? You guys don't mind? We can fellowship a little bit. If you want to open your Bibles to the book of Mark in chapter 1, that's where we're going to be tonight. And uh, appreciate the worship songs that we had tonight, Brother Aaron. I don't know if you took my, the, what I sent to you, what my title was going to be about tonight, but we were talking about being soldiers and, and fighting the battle and, and winning the victory. And that's kind of where I'm going tonight with my message. Right? I want to speak to you on the subject of winning a battle or winning a spiritual battle. It's going to be the name of the sermon tonight. And again, we are in Mark chapter 1. We're going to start reading off here in verse 21. Our Bible reads, And they went into Capernaum, and straight away on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they, were, and they were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know who the... Uh, I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad, through all through the region, round about Galilee. Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture. Thank you for this amazing story from the life of Jesus. I just pray that you fill me with your spirit today, Lord, and that's why I have notes prepared. And I just hope that if, you know, something else needs to be said as it comes up, you guide me with the spirit and you help me to say things that don't need to be said. I pray that you prepare everyone that's listening here, prepare their hearts so that it may be edifying to them in some manner. In Jesus' name, amen. I really enjoy the Gospel of Mark. It's like a great action movie. It's, it's action-packed. It's always moving from, t- from place to place. The pace is just great. You know, it's, it's a book that displays the urgency of Jesus Christ. It's always straight away, immediately. He went there, right? And I think we can, we can learn in our lives about how we need to have some urgency in our own lives. You know, how does this book start off? You know, it starts off and just talks about how Jesus was, John the Baptist came, he baptized Jesus. Then Jesus went, got some disciples, and immediately he got to work. He preaches in the synagogue here and he casts out this evil spirit. We need to have that same urgency because, you know, we are living in the last days. Amen. And then we're living in a culture that is becoming more and more worldly by the day, by the year, everything that passes by, right? People are falling away from Christ, even though some of those people that are calling themselves Christians do not know the Christ of the Bible, As Pastor preached last Wednesday, we need to be ready to contend for the faith. We need to be ready to win some battles. It is time for us to enter the battle in order to win this battle, to become a better soldier for Christ, to get out and win souls. I believe the passage we just led lays out kind of the path that we need to follow if we are going to win that battle. It shows Jesus Christ casting out a devil here, showing that he is the authority. He has the power over the devil. He has the power over the evil, the unclean spirits. And he shows us, gives us kind of a blueprint, so to say, on how to win this battle. When we get in the battle, well, the first thing I notice here, and the first point I want to point out to you here, is that there's got to be a conviction. Right? When we start off in in verse 21, he says he went into Capernaum and straight on the Sabbath day, he taught in the synagogue, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught that as one that had authority. He convicted those people. But the conviction starts with the place. Jesus went to the place where the people were were, right? He entered into Capernaum. So if you're not familiar with kind of the geography in the area, Capernaum, that's located on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. It was a city that began around the second century BC, and while it wasn't a large town, it was only a town of about 1,500 people, compared to the other villages in the area, it was a pretty good-sized town compared to some of the other ones, and it was a merchant town. There was people coming in and out. It was on the main trade route from Damascus to Egypt, You know, it's best known for its fishing, being right there on the sea. It's where Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they were called from Capernaum to follow Jesus and be his disciples. Later, as we read in the book of Mark, that's where Matthew was also called from the city of Capernaum. Comparing Scripture with Scripture, we see this is where Jesus came right after he was kicked out of his hometown, right after he was chased out, right? If you want to flip over to, and we also see not only that, it fulfilled some prophecy too. 
So if you want to turn over to Matthew chapter 4, I want to show you something there. But as you're turning there, in Luke 4, that's the scripture of scripture where it says that uh, Jesus went into the synagogue there in his hometown of Nazareth, and, and he read from the book of Isaiah and said, you know, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he became to preach the gospel to the poor, to preach deliverance, to heal the brokenhearted, let the blind recover their sight. And when he said, today the scripture is fulfilled, they sought to throw him down the hill of the city. So they chased him out. And where did he go? He went into Capernaum. And another parallel passage over in Matthew 4, starting off in verse 13, we see how this fulfills some scripture. Right? Matthew 4, chapter 13, it says, the Bible reads, And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelled in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zabulon and Nephtalim, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zabulon, the land of Nephtalim, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region in the shadow of death, light is sprung up. Now that's a direct quote from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And Isaiah was writing here about how this land was going to become dark with the Assyrian invasion. But soon, at some point in time, there was going to be a light spring back up in this city. There was going to be something that was going to deliver him out of the darkness, and Jesus was that light. And it's just, to me, it's amazing when we read like this. This is one of over 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled out of the scripture. You know, it gives the Bible credibility. It lets us know that the book we are reading is true. And it also gives me comfort knowing, it should give you comfort knowing that our Lord Jesus Christ, he's always right where he needs to be. He's always right where the Bible wants him to be, always right where God says he's going to be. And he's always there. And Jesus made this city of Capernaum, he made it his home. As he says in Matthew verse 9, he said Jesus entered it into his own city. This is kind of where he made his home base. So this is where he decided that he needed to be to convict the people when he was doing his northern Galilean ministry. But beyond the, beyond the city there, he also went straight away into the synagogue. Right? So what do, you, what do you think of when you hear the word synagogue? Imagine if you're like me, you think a Jewish church. Right? And that's where, kind of where our mind goes. But we should know that it, that it was much more than that back in those days. It was more than a church, because the, they still had the temple built. That's where the Jews did their main worship, where they would go and they would sacrifice and they would do their prayers and their worship at the altar in Jerusalem. But synagogues were all around the small little towns. In fact, any place where there was 10 or more Jewish boys over the age of 12, they could build a synagogue. And these served as gathering places. You know, this is where the children came and they were taught throughout the week in school, where if something was going on in the city and they needed to have a political vote, this is where they would come, make that happen. When they decided to get together and have themselves a good old potluck dinner, the synagogue was where they came and met. And of course, it is where they would go on the Sabbath day when they were ready to read the scriptures and be taught. So it was, you know, basically it was their meeting place. It was the place to be. If you wanted to know anything that was going on, you hang around the synagogue. It's not like today with our cell phones, right? We can just punch up and look on social media and see what people are doing or give them a quick text and find out. If people wanted to communicate, they had to get together and actually talk in person. So it became custom. It became habit for people to meet there, right? It was a regular practice at this time also that when traveling preachers, traveling rabbis or scribes came through, they were called to come teach out of the synagogue, right? It's not like somebody today would just show up at our church door and we'd just let them in and say, yeah, come on in and teach, no, but that was kind of regular practice back in those days. So Jesus made it his custom. You know, every time he went into a city, he would find that synagogue because he knew that's where the Jewish people were going to be. When he was going to go out and convict people, he wanted to be where the people were so people could hear the message. Paul made that his practice too. When the Apostle Paul started doing his ministry, he went to where the Jewish people would be. And you know, when Jesus was questioned about it, that's exactly what he said. After he was arrested and he was being questioned by the Jewish leaders, like, what are you preaching? What do you come to tell these people? What did, what did Jesus answer him in John 18? Jesus says, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple. Where did the Jews always resort? And in secret, I have said nothing. So he came out, he came to preach loud, and he came to preach boldly where the people were. But not only that, that's not what made him authoritative though, right? What was it that he came to preach? 
Because it says here in Mark 20, or 22, it says, they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Man, these people, they were astonished by his doctrine. They were amazed, shocked. We might say in our own vernacular, what did he say? It just blew my mind. But you know what? It also probably made him a little uncomfortable, a little fearful, because they are not exactly sure what they were hearing, because it was different than what they were used to, but they knew it was the truth. It was different than the way the scribes had been teaching, the different the way the other rabbis would come through, because they would come through and they would, they would teach and they would get up there and they'd read some scripture and they would say, well, this is what this rabbi says this means and this is what this rabbi says this means or Moses said this. It was different than the prophets that they were used to hearing because if you read the prophets in the book of the Old Testament, it always started off, and the word of the Lord came upon someone and thus saith the Lord. But that's not how Jesus spoke. Jesus was speaking it differently. He was speaking to him as one that had authority, as what he was saying was the word of God. He would say stuff like, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, this is how it is. He said, verily, verily, I say, not the Lord said. He was speaking as if he was God because he is God. He is that living word of God. He didn't preface it with anything like that because he did not need to. He spoke like his words because they were. He is a living word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So God came preaching those words with that authority. But what did he preach? He came preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. What we just read in that parallel passage, if we would kept reading on in Matthew 4, 17, it said, upon this time, Jesus taught to repent because the kingdom of God was near. He would say things to him like, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one come to Christ except by me. He said, come unto me and I will give you rest. He said, those that believe on him will not perish, but everlasting life. And he said that he came to save the lost. And this was all a truly brand new to them. It astounded them. It amazed them. And I tell you, it convicted them. It got them to thinking. In John chapter 6, he tells his disciples that he is the bread of life. And the Pharisees begin to question him and saying, what do you mean by this? And in verses 53 through 59 in the book of John, Jesus says unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me even shall live by my name. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. You know, it was this kind of teaching that astonished them. This kind of thing here that, that blew their mind. They'd never heard anything like this before. And to be honest, it scared a lot of people. Some of these people, they were left. They were offended by his teaching. Others were convicted. They were convinced. And they believe. We as a group of Christians, we need to remember that. That we're going out and we're trying to win that spiritual battle. We're trying to get involved in that. And we're going to try to get people to come to Christ. It isn't what we think, how we feel, or what we do that saves. It is that word of God. It is that word of God that's going to convict a soul. And it's going to bring them to Christ. We need to get out and preach the truth. And we need to preach it with authority, just as Jesus did. You know, as Romans 10, 14 says, How shall they call on them who they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher. We are the ones that are called out to preach out that word, to speak the good news of Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's what we need to preach. Not what we think is going to get people to heaven. What the Bible says is going to get people to heaven. Preach the words that came out of Jesus' mouth. He is the living word of God. Because the world today, they're hearing from so many different sources. So many so-called Christians that say, hey, you can live life in your sin. You can live life the way you want to live it, you know? They tell them that, hey, you come to church and it's okay if you're homosexual. God made you that way. And he loves you the way you are. They say that it's, it's all right if you want to live with that woman or that boy before you get married and, and fornicate because, you know, you got to try it out first, you know. They'll say it's okay if you want to go out on a Friday night and have a few drinks with your buddies as long as you don't get totally wasted and make a fool out of yourself. But that's not the truth. It's not what the Word of God says. It's not what we need to be telling people as Christians. And far too often that's what we hear coming from churches and Christians all across this country. Now, more than ever, the truth needs to get out, and it's our job to do it. But how can we preach the truth if we don't know the truth? 
right? I am thankful every day that I have a church that I know that I can come to, that when I come here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, I'm going to hear the truth from behind this pulpit. But some people don't know that. Some people don't have that. So it's our job to get it out there. And if we're going to tell people the truth, we need to know the truth. So we need to be like the Berean believers. And even though we come here, we need to stay in our Bibles all the time. Kind of, kind of reminds me of a, a story I just heard about a pastor. He went to have dinner with some of the members of his congregation. And it was their wedding anniversary. And they had all the nice little fine silverware out and all the nice little plates and stuff like that. And after they ate and they left, the woman realized one of her nice spoons was missing. She's like, man, pastor stole my spoon. Can you believe that? And the husband's like, no, there's no way he stole his spoon. So they're like, well, let's look for it. And they looked for it all the rest of the night. They couldn't find it. They kind of slipped their mind. About a week goes by, and it's still kind of bugging them. And they looked again. And they tore that whole house apart, and they could not find the spoon. So the next Sunday when they went to church, they kind of confronted the pastor. They're like, hey, you took advantage of us. We brought you to our house. Why are you stealing our nice silverware? The pastor said, I didn't steal it. I put it in your Bible. And we would laugh and we think that's funny, but how many people, if that happened to us, would we notice that that spoon was in our Bible? That we have a Bible that just sits on our desk that never gets opened. We need to make sure that doesn't happen, right? Because when we stay in Scripture, it not only will allow us to give the gospel with authority to others, you know, it's going to keep the Spirit inside us fresh. It's going to convict us of our wrongdoings and allow us to win the spiritual battles that are in our life as well. But back to our gospel story here. Jesus came preaching the truth. He came to convict people, and he did that in that synagogue because he was in the right place. He was where the people were. And there was at least one man that got convicted that night, a man with an unclean spirit. And he was about to be right in front of Jesus. He was about to be eye to eye with him and go through my second point here of a spiritual battle because after, after uh, conviction, there has to be a confrontation. You got to come eye to eye with Jesus. and You have to face what's going on in your life. In verse 23, it says there was a man with an unclean spirit who was in their synagogue, and he cried out. So that's the first thing I want you to notice was his cry, right? The unclean spirit, the demon that was inside that man, he took control of his voice. And what did he cry out? He said, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. The demon knew who Jesus was. He had no qualms about it. You know, and that should be no surprise because the book of James in chapter 2 tells us that the demons know Jesus. In James 2.19 it says, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But even though the devil, that unclean spirit, that demon, even though he recognized Jesus, notice the first thing he did was try to discredit him. He tried to discredit He said, what have we to do with thee, Jesus of Nazareth? He's saying, we're not the same. we got nothing in common. What are you doing here? You know, we've done nothing to you. Why don't you just leave us alone? Get out of here. And he also tried to, tried to put him down, right? Oh, Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth wasn't a very, very popular place at that point in time. If you think back in your, your scripture, what happened when... Uh, Philip went and told Nathaniel he found the Messiah, and it was Jesus from Nazareth. And what did he say? He said, could any good thing come from Nazareth? No, Nazareth had a, had a horrible reputation, and that's what the, the devil, that unclean spirit, was crying out in front of the people there. Everybody could hear him through that voice, calling him Jesus of Nazareth, like, you can't be God. You can't be. What do you got to do with this, Jesus of Nazareth? You're from Nazareth. You're no good. You have, you have no power here. You have no authority here, you know? And there are many that try to do that today, too. They try to discredit Jesus. They want to tell you that Jesus was just a good prophet or Jesus was just, just a good man to walk the earth. They don't, want to, they don't want to admit that he's the Holy Son of God. They don't admit that he was God in flesh. But I tell you, he was. And there's many verses we can find in our Bible that proclaim the deity of Christ. You know, if we get to the end here, the demon's even going to say, I know who they are, the Holy One of God. He's going to proclaim it. But one of my favorites, you know, that just kind of proves that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh is Colossians verses, chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Who, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Jesus is our creator. He is our God. No matter how much the demons try to discredit him, 
and say that, no, who are you, Jesus of Nazareth? What are you coming to do here? No. But after the demon tried to discredit Jesus, notice that he, he was also, he was pretty fearful. He said, art thou come to destroy us? You know, human souls, us people here, we're not the only ones waiting on that second coming of Jesus. I'm looking out for it. The devil and his demons, they're aware too. They know it's coming. Although, you know, we're looking forward to it in joy that one day we get to live and reign. Man, they're looking forward in a day of fear because they know sooner or later their destruction is coming. It's going to be no surprise to them. And that's what he's like, have you come to destroy us? That's what the demon is asking. Is it that time now? Because we know our days are numbered. We know sooner or later, Jesus Christ, that you are going to reign over this earth and you're going to send us into that fiery pit. Is that today? Is that our day? I was really intrigued here in this verse, though, in this whole little verse here by the word, use of the word us, right? Because it reads that an unclean spirit, a singular, an unclean spirit was in that man. But what does it read here? He says, let us alone. Hath thou come to destroy us? So I got to do some study on that because... My initial thought was it was him and the man. And several commentaries, though, say, you know, that's not what he's talking about here. When this demon's saying us, he's referring to all the many evil spirits that were around there, that they're all going to get taken away, and that Jesus was coming for them all. And I can see that point of view. I can see where these commentators are saying with that. But like I said, that wasn't my first thought. My first thought was when he's saying us, he's talking about him, the unclean spirit. He's talking about that man that he's inside of. That was kind of my first thought. And I like how Warren Wearsby said, he said, the demon's use of plural pronouns shows how closely he was identified with the man through whom he was speaking. You know, when someone's got evil inside of them, got that demon inside of them, the devil inside of them, they become like one. And I believe many demons have people saying, when we try to get him to come to Christ, don't go to Christ. He's come to destroy us. He's come to destroy me. He's come to destroy you. And it stops people from coming to Christ. It stops people when they believe in salvation because they believe that their life's going to end. And they're going to be destroyed by this choice that they're about to make. And you know, in a way, they're half right because they have to die to themselves. They do. They have to die and become a new person. All new creatures are born again, right? But they're not getting destroyed. They're being reborn. They're getting rebirthed. It is not destruction. It's not the same thing that's coming on those evil spirits. But that's what keeps people, in my opinion, away from Christ, is that fear, is that evil spirit coming out saying, no, Jesus of Nazareth, you are going to, what are you here for? Are you here to destroy us? No, he's here to destroy the unclean spirit, to get that devil out and have a reborn person. But after the discrediting and the the fearful statements, you notice at the very end of his cry out here, there is an acknowledgement of exactly who Jesus is. He says, I know who thee art, the Holy One of God. Not a holy one, not a prophet, not a great person. He says, you are the holy one of God. This is clearly being a reference to Jesus being the Messiah, being the Savior that was coming from God. You know, the book of Isaiah constantly refers to our Redeemer, our future Savior, as being the holy one. You know, just one example of that is in Isaiah 48, 17. Thus said the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teaches thee the prophet, which leadeth thee by the way that thou should go. So the demon knew exactly who he was. No matter how much he tried to discredit him, no matter how much how fearful he was and tried to make the person he was inhabiting and fearful, he knew who Jesus was at the end of his cry. And he had to admit it because there's no other thing he could do. It's the truth. So he had to say who Jesus was. So now that man and that demon, they're face to face with Jesus. They just admitted who Jesus was. The next thing I want you to know here in this confrontation was just a simple command. In verse 25, and Jesus rebuked him, saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. Simple little message right there. Notice there was no no pomp and circumstance. Nothing, Nothing crazy that the guy was told to do. Jesus didn't say, go out and run around this building three or four times. You know, that'll get that spirit out of you. He didn't say, go down and hop in the river. Baptize yourself down in there. That, that'll scare that spirit out of you. He didn't make him lay down on a table and get out a little water stick and start sprinkling on him and saying chants like we think of when you see like exorcisms on TV, right? He just simply spoke. 
He said the words. It's God's word that has the power. It has the power to convict. And those same words have the power to save. It is Jesus. It is God, our almighty Savior. He does the saving, not us. And again, his words have power. As it says in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Powerful words. It is a weapon. It is a sword. James 1.21 says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity, superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. It is the word that saves. It is his words that win the battle. And his words were simple. He didn't say a lot of them. First, he just said, hold thy peace. In other words, he said, be quiet. Shut your mouth. Shut your trap. Be quiet, devil. He says, I don't need you. I don't need your testimony. I don't need the testimony of devils. I got the testimony of God the Father. I got the testimony of my disciples. And you know, that's something that you always see throughout all the gospel accounts, whenever Jesus is going around. He's always telling the demons to be quiet. He's always saying, we don't need to hear from you. I don't care what you have to say about me. I have the power over you. You have no authority here. He doesn't want to be associated with evil. As I said, him, his father, and his disciples, his apostles, they will testify of him. He doesn't need that. And then he gave a straightforward command. He didn't say a long prayer. He didn't make a big deal about anything. Jesus said four simple words come out of him. And that's all it took. That's all it took for Jesus to win that spiritual battle. And he is that powerful. He is that strong. We need to remember that when we enter into spiritual battles and we get other people, it's not our words. It's Jesus' words. And his words are simple. After the command, though, the last thing that I want to bring to your attention here in this confrontation is the convulsions. Right? In verse 26, it says, When the unclean spirit had torn him and cried out with a loud voice, he come out of him. Now, the demon was obedient here, but he shrieked. And he tore him. And the word tore here means that he threw him on the ground. Right? And he kind of was convulsions. But the demons were obedient. They came out of him. You know, this isn't the only time that we hear about demons doing this to people. You think about the, in Mark chapter 9, we read a story of a little boy who's inhabited by evil spirits, who's inhabited by demons. And they constantly throw him on the ground. And they constantly try to throw him in the fire. It seems it may be common practice of unclean spirits and of devils to try to hurt the ones they are in. And as this one was cast out, he tried one last time. He tried one last ditch effort to hurt the person. But he was unsuccessful in that. Because again, if you look at the parallel passage of this, if you were to flip over to Luke chapter 4, this is what the Bible reads. It says, And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him, and he hurt him not. Oh, he tried. He made him convulse. He threw him on the ground. But when Jesus casts those evil spirits out of our lives, he's going to replace it with his spirit. And his spirit is going to protect us. we got the Holy Ghost residing inside of us. And no matter how hard those demons, those devils try to throw us down, try to get a hold on us, try to hurt us, they have no power. They are strong, but they are nothing compared to our God. As it says in 1 John 4, 4, he says, You are God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Our God is powerful, and he's going to stop those demons. He's going to stop those devils. When they're gone, they're gone, and they're not getting back in. So we've seen the conviction here, how Jesus preached to the people. He used his words to get them to want to change. We see the, the confrontation where the, the devil and the evil had to face Jesus eye to eye and got thrown out. And the last thing I want you to notice here tonight is the confusion that followed. In chapter 27, it says, They were all amazed. And so much that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. You know, kind of when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, you ever seen a magician? Maybe he's standing there, or a lady, and they throw some sprinkles up in the air, and all of a sudden when it falls down on them, they just change clothes. And you're like, whoa, whoa, hold on. Back up. Let's do a retake here. How did that just happen? Everything just happened so fast, and I have no clue what you just did. I imagine that's how these people were feeling right here. Like, whoa, hold on a minute. You know, we heard this guy shriek. We heard him yell at you. You just said four words to him. And all of a sudden this unclean spirit's gone. How 
did that happen? The difference is this was no magic, was it? No, this is, this is true. This is the power of our God. They had to be shocked. They were amazed, and they were even fearful. And they began to talk about it. So much had his fame spread all across the region of Galilee. But his fame didn't spread because of who he was. No, his fame spread because of what he did. And that confusion lingered in Capernaum. Why? Because a lot of them, they saw his deeds there, but they would not yet believe on him. They were confused. They would see the deeds, they would see what was going on, but they wouldn't believe the words that were coming out of his mouth. And they wouldn't believe him when he told them what was going on. Many times, we might want to tell ourselves, you know, or other people, other people say, if I just saw a miracle from God, I would believe. If I just saw him do something in my life, if he could just prove to me that he's real, I, w- I would really believe on him then. Well, the people of Capernaum, they demonstrate that's not the case. You know, there were many, many miracles done in that city. In Matthew chapter 8, we read the Roman centurion who was in that town, whose servant was healed by Jesus from afar. In John chapter 4, we read of a nobleman and his son, again, that was close to death. Jesus from afar just said, go thy way, and he'd be healed, and he was healed. Right after this, Jesus goes in and heals Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus heals a man with palsy in Capernaum, where he's lowered down from the ceiling. You probably know that story, right? In Mark chapter 5, Jesus heals a woman that has issues with blood for 12 years as he was going to bring back Jairus' daughter back from the dead. All of these things happened in Capernaum. And yet, these, peri- these people never believed on Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Because Jesus tells us himself in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Now this just goes to prove that just seeing the miracles of Jesus, seeing the works, it doesn't lead to believing. We can show those miracles all the time. You know, what it can do, it can open the door. It can open the door, it can make people confused. It can make people question. It can make them want to know more. But then we got to roll this battle all over again. we got to start right back in the beginning. And we got to start with the hard preaching of God's word and get that conviction so people will come to believe. So how do we apply this to our lives today? How can you take this lesson? Well, we need to have this urgency of Christ and start being a part of, of winning some spiritual battles. And we need to start today. You know, No one knows the day of the Lord. No one knows when that end is coming. But I can tell you every day we wake up, it gets one day closer. So it's never too early to start. We need to be getting out where the people are. We need to find those people, whether it be in our workplace, in our community. And you know, as I was doing this, I, 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 we always say that you're preaching to ourselves, you're right? I convicted myself because I'm thinking, where are the people at? They're on social media. We got, and I get something I got to do better at. I got to put more stuff about Christ on my social media page. That's where the people are. I need to get the word out there. We need to be getting the gospel out and letting the words of the Holy Spirit convict those people, right? And though their flesh and the evil that's within them, they're going to try to discredit Jesus. They're going to try to pull him away, right? We just need to be relentless with that word. Get them to have that confrontation. Give them no choice but to stand face to face with Jesus. And he will deliver that spiritual victory. He will win that battle for us. And then when others notice that changed life, you know, they're going to question it. They're going to be confused. A lot of people were confused by me once I came to Christ and I was no longer the, the same guy when I wouldn't go out to the bars with them anymore on a Friday night. When Amen. it came Sunday morning, I'm getting up and going to church instead of sitting there with a the hangover, calling them up to watch baseball games or basketball games. It confused them. They didn't, they didn't quite understand it. They didn't know what was going on. And seeing that wouldn't change their life, but it gave me the opportunity. It gave me the opportunity to tell them why my life has changed. It gave me the opportunity to preach Jesus Christ to them. And we start that cycle over and over again because of the amazement, because of the confusion. It opens that door. We need to start multiplying the kingdom of heaven. And just like it was here in the book of Mark, we need to do it immediately. We need to do it straight way. And we need to have an urgency about us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for just being a great and awesome God and for coming to us and giving us this lesson from the book of Mark and how you just so simply won the spiritual battle for us, Lord. You showed that Jesus Christ has the power over all realms on this world and in the spiritual world, and he just cast that demon out. 
I pray that there's anyone in this room, Lord, that hasn't known you as their Savior, that they get convicted today, the Holy Spirit convicts them, and, and they learn that, and they come to know and believe in their heart that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, and that he has the power to save. All I need to do is come face to face with him and say, God, I need you in my life. I need you to save me because I can't do it on my own. I can't do it by my works, Lord. And maybe there's somebody out there that's already saved, Lord, and they just need to rededicate their lives to you. I pray that you, you convict them and you give them the power to say, I'm going to get in that battle today, God. I'm going to start winning people for you because our time is short, Lord, and we never know when that last day is coming, but it's coming soon, so we need to win more people to Christ. We need to change the trajectory of this country, of this people, and get more people to know our Lord. I pray that as we, we wrap up today, Lord, that you bless the people that are listening, bless all those online, and keep us safe and healthy until we come back and see you again in your house. In Jesus' name, amen.